Hello everyone, Namaste. Welcome to lecture three of this inorganic chemistry group D, analytical and instrumental. This is the mother Koyala. So in our first lecture, we introduced uh, chemical analysis and titration. In our second lecture, we talked about redox titration and redox indicators. Today, in our third lecture, we'll be discussing about chemometric titration and precipitation titration, these two topics. So let's go back to the syllabus and see what we're supposed to discuss in these two topics. In complexometric titration, we have to discuss metal ion indicators. And in precipitation titration, we have to discuss adsorption indicators. Before we go into the topic, let's revise this slide one more time. Um, we already discussed about the redox titration. On complexometric titration, you can look at the definition. This titration is based on metal ligand complex session. So it basically will be forming a complex between a metal and ligand. Like in this example, Mg is the metal and EDTA is the ligand and you are forming this metal ligand complex. And the precipitation titration in which the titan and titan form a precipitate. Uh, in this example, you are reacting AgNO3 with Cl- to produce AgCl precipitate. Okay. So if we go back to the practical one more time, uh, these are some of the practicals. And on the next slide, these are more practicals that we need to do. And these, I just want to share them because most of these are uh, related to the topic that we are discussing today. For example, you see this uh, silver nitrate. So should be for precipitation titration, NaCl and KCl using silver nitrate, precipitation titration, uh, adsorption indicator, EDTA, today's stuff like uh, we'll be discussing on complexometric titration, harness and the amount of zinc and copper using EDTA, all these, they are related to uh, complexometric and um, precipitation titration. Okay. So let's get into the topic. Uh, complexometric titration. These are some of the terminologies that we need to get familiar with. So like I showed in previous slide, there is metal, which we call analyte or since it's in the ionic form, it is cation. And there is ligand, ligand, whatever you call. They have different name. You can call it Cylon, complexing agent, chelating agent, sequestering agent. So these two form a complex, which is called chelate, complex ion, coordination compound, metal complex, or chelate compound. So this is complex metric titration, okay? You have metal and ligand to form a complex ion. And for that, we'll be using a metal ion indicator. So this indicator will help us to determine the equivalent point or the end point of the titration. And these are some of the definitions. You have a ligand, which is a charged or neutral species with a lone pair of electron that forms the coordinate bond with the metal or metal ion. So you have a metal or metal ion, which we call uh, analyte, that forms a coordinate bond with ligand that contains lone pair of electron or negative charge to form this chelate. okay? So these are some of the examples of the ligand. And the number of form bond formed by a ligand is called their denticity. So if it only forms one bond with the metal, then it is called unidented. 
If it forms two, then it is called didentate. And if it is form, it can form more than two, then it is called polydentate. And the chelating agent that forms water soluble complex with bi or polyvalent metal ions are called sequestering agent. So sequestering agent is also a complex, a complexing agent or ligand, which can form water soluble complex. And when a polydentate a ligand can simultaneously form more than one bond with the same metal ion, it forms a ring structure called chelate. The complexing agent is called a chelating agent. So if it can form more than one bond, then the uh, complexing agent is called chelating agent. And the thus formed complex it, call, it is called chelate. The complex is formed when one or more charged or neutral species having lone pair of electrons form a coordinate bond with the metal. So whenever they, they form a coordinate bond between the metal and the uh, agent, then thus formed compound is called complex. So complex symmetric titration, it is a types of titration, which uh, which can be used to analyze the metal ion for quantitative or for qualitative purpose. So this is the titration between the metal ion and the complexing agent in presence of indicator. Okay. The indicator is also a complexing agent, but it forms less stable complex with metal ion. So what this third point is saying is, uh, like in acid based titration, the indicator is a acid or base. In redox titration, the indicator was a reducing or the oxidizing agent. Similarly, in complex symmetric titration, the indicator is also the complexing agent and it forms a complex with metal ion. However, the complex formed between the metal ion and the indicator is less stable. Okay. Indicators should impart different. Uh, distinct color in complexation and decomplexation. That means, so the indicator can exist by itself or it can also form complex with the metal. So when it is formed on itself, it will have one color and when it is forming the complex, it will have different color. And that's how you determine the end point, okay? And finally, the complexation reaction occurs in a stepwise fashion. So this here, it shows that it occurs in stepwise. That means one metal first bind with one ligand to form metal ligand complex, okay? However, this metal ligand complex that can again react with another ligand, ligand to, form, to form metal binding with two ligands, okay? Similarly, it can form metal binding with three ligands or metal binding with more ligands. So it occurs in stepwise fashion. So um, metal, the complex, in for the most complex that are one is to one. That is one metal bind with one uh, ligand. However, it can also be one metal with two ligands or two metal with one ligand. All of these are possible. So during titration, the free metal ions or free metals are progressively complexed by the EDTA. Uh, here EDTA is uh, used as a specific example. It could be ligand as well until ultimately the metal is displaced from the complex of metal indicator to leave the free indicator. So what happens is uh, during titration, you have reagent in conical flask and you have reagent in burette. So usually the ligand or the here EDTA is in the burette and you have metal ion in the conical flask and in the same conical flask you also add indicator. So what happens is since you're adding very small amount of indicator, the indicator will bind with metal to form metal indicator complex. So as you keep adding the EDTA from the burette, the EDTA will first react with free metal. It keeps reacting until the free metals exist. Then afterward, the 
the then added EDTA will react with metal indicator. So the EDTA will replace the indicator from metal indicator complex. That will leave the free indicator. Okay. So that example is shown in the reaction here. So before end point, you have metal ion. It is in the conical flask. The metal indicator, it is also in the conical flask. Now you add it EDTA from burette. As you keep adding the EDTA, the EDTA will combine with metal to form metal EDTA complex. And it's still the metal indicator complex also exists. Why this metal indicator exists? Because you have metal ion to combine with EDTA. Now at the end point, there is no metal ions. So once you add the EDTA, this EDTA will replace the indicator from metal indicator complex. And it will form metal EDTA complex and the EDTA will is not complexed with the metal. So what is going on here? Since this metal EDTA is more stable than metal indicator, the forward reaction is favored. So at this point, you can see that metal indicator will have different color and the free indicator will have different color. So when this reaction occur, the second reaction when it occurs, the color changes from the color of metal indicator to the free indicator. Okay, and this reaction occurs because metal indicator, metal EDTA is more stable than metal indicator. So here are some of the examples of complexing agent. The first example is EDTA, and these are the short forms. E stands for ethylene. Ethylene means two carbon chain. D stands for diamine. On the both carbon chain, there is one amine attached. T stands for tetra. Tetra means four. And acetic acid. A stands for acetic acid. So that means there are there is two carbon chain length. The carbon chain length is two. Both of them are attached to amine. Here it is represented by nitrogen. So that is diamine. And these nitrogen, they are supposed to have two hydrogens. Instead of two hydrogens, they are attached to acetic acid. So these are four acetic acid. So each nitrogen is attached to two, two acetic acid. So hence there are total of four acetic acids. The longest carbon chain length is two. That is ethylene and ethylene diamine tetra acetic acid. And this is one of the example of complexing agent. Okay. DTPA, diethylene means two ethylene, triamine, that means three amine group, penta means five acetic acid. So the, this compound has five acetic acid and it has triamine that means three nitrogen group amine group and there are two ethylene group and you can see it here those two ethylene groups are this is one ethylene group and this is another ethylene group triamine means one two three triamine and penta acetic acid so five acetic acid group one two three four five five acetic acid okay ZTA, ethylene glycol bis amino ethyl ether tetracetic acid. The structure is shown here. Okay, little complex structure. And ammonia is also the complexing agent. It's, it's simple and it's three. And the last one is ethylene diamine. So ethylene is ethylene and diamine is two amine group. Okay, so that's how um, these are some of the complexing agent. Our most of our focus will be on um, 
EDTA. So basically, whenever we say complexing agent, we understand it as an EDTA. Okay. So uh, these uh, complexing agent or any complexing agent, they form the complex with metal and they can form complex with several metals. Okay, for example, here is um, EDTA and these are some of the ions shown here, which is calcium 2 plus, magnesium 2 plus, iron 3 plus, Mn 2 plus, copper 2 plus, zinc 2 plus. So EDTA can basically form complex with any of these ions. However, they are defined, the strength of that uh, complex is defined by the stability complex, a uh, constant, okay? So the value given here is the stability constant. Greater the value is, more stable the complex is. So for EDTA, uh, the largest value is 25.1. So it combines best with iron 3 plus. Okay, and in this example, it uh, forms the less stable complex with magnesium 2 plus in this example, okay, given for these given metal ions. So again, EDT can form complex with any of these ions. However, the most uh, st stable is with iron 3 plus and the least stable in this given example is magnesium 2 plus according to these constant values. So pyrophosphoric acid, for example, it forms the most stable with complex with eight point, uh, with the value 8.7 with zinc 2 plus. It does not form any complex with iron 3 plus and manganese 2 plus. And it forms the least one with calcium 2 plus. Similarly, all these other chelating agent they have different uh, stability constant with different metal. So for example, if you want to uh, study the concentration of iron three plus, then the better uh, chelating agent is EDTA because of this value. Also citric acid because uh, it is 11.7, which is comparatively more than the other values. And it looks like tartaric acid is also better and this glycine is also better because the 10 is greater than other values that glycine forms with the other ions. So what we have to understand is, let's say we want to analyze calcium using EDTA, okay? So if you want to uh, analyze the concentration of calcium ion in water sample and you are using uh, complexometric titration and for that you, you used EDTA as the chelating agent and you are using uh, indicator as well. So you can see that if there are other ions, for example, if there is iron ions present, then it will interfere, it will also form complex with EDTA. That means it is for, it interfere the analysis of calcium 2 plus. So what does this mean is the iron ion is also considered as calcium 2 plus. Why? Because this forms a stronger complex with EDTA. So if calcium 2 plus is the analyte, there are other interfering ions as well. So what it's saying is analyte may be interfered by other ions, okay? So the best way is either to remove the iron three plus from the complex, for, uh, from the solution first or remove all other possible ions from the uh, solution first and then analyze the calcium two plus. Otherwise this technique is not Good technique, okay? So since the, uh, there is interference, we can use this masking agent, okay? So what does masking means? Mask, like we use mask to 
avoid dust entering into our respiratory system. We, are, we have these agents which we can use to stop them in our solution or to, to stop them in our solution to, to stop their participants in our reaction, okay? So the masking is blocking of species or its reaction product without physical separation. So we are not physically separating it. However, we are blocking them. So here you can mask the, you can block by using two techniques. One of them is precipitation technique and the other one is complexation technique. So in this precipitation technique, you form precipitate. Okay, for example, if you want to uh, mask lead and copper, you can use sulfide, like hydrogen sulfide, to form PBS, which will form precipitate, and it will precipitate out. Now it will no more interfere our analyte. Similarly, copper will no more <coughs> interfere with our analyte if we from sulfide, if they, we react with sulfide. So however, if our uh, solution has a lead and calcium, if our has lead and calcium, then we can use oxalate. If we use oxalate, then we, need, we, can, uh, we can precipitate lead ion and calcium ion, and then do the, now we must mark state, then we can do the complex symmetric titration. Okay, so this is the technique where we precipitate the unwanted ions. Once we precipitate the unwanted ions, then we can analyze the wanted ions. However, you can also form complex. Like in our previous example, I showed you iron might interfere the analysis of calcium. Now you can use ascorbic acid. So if you use ascorbic acid, then it will form complex with iron ion. And once it forms the complex, it is masked, so it does not participate in other reaction. Then we can use EDTA, okay? So if you want to uh, max these ions, then you can use KCN. And if you want to max aluminum and iron, then you can use ammonium fluoride. So again, in our previous slide, we showed that uh, one, complexing agent can form complex with several ligand. Since it can form with several ligands, complex with several ligand, the complexometric titration is not selective. To make it selective, we use masking agent. So in prior knowledge, we should have prior knowledge what kind of ions might be present in our sample and knowing that we can use this masking agent to block those species in our, um, in our reaction and it is not the physical separation. So we are not physically separating it. However, we are forming other, uh, other, com other compound to separate them, okay? So um, once we max them, we should also be able to demax them. So that means, say you max it, some of the, um, say you max iron, and then you want to analyze the iron again, then you have to, you should be able to demax. So there are demasking agent as well. So what is the demasking agent? So you form the max, compound, then you use the demasking agent to, to, to free the ion, okay? The ability of the marked, masked substance to participate in the reaction is recovered. So you recover the ion. This is useful if a sample contains a mixture of two or more metal cation. Okay, we'll see the example later on. So cyanide complex of zinc and cadmium may be demarked using formaldehyde acetic acid solution. So this is the complex of zinc cyanide that we use cyanide to mark zinc. Okay, now we, we mark zinc. However, we want to, 
in previous slide you saw that uh, cyanide can max several other ions as well like silver copper mercury cadmium right and if you demarked with this reagent you can uh, form the ion originate the ions of zinc and cadmium so you use formaldehyde and acidic acid so this example is only for zinc it could be same for cyanide uh, cadmium and you recover zinc 2 plus so once you recover this zinc 2 plus now you can um, analyze this if you want to okay so here is an example so this example is suppose a sample contains calcium cadmium and copper ion so in one sample you have three of these ions present okay those ions are calcium cadmium and copper and EDA titration can be used for quantitative analysis okay now you are using EDTA as a complexing agent for the quantitative analysis of these three ions how would you analyze them so the question is how would you determine the concentration of calcium ion in the solution how would you determine the concentration of cadmium ion in the solution and how would you determine the concentration of copper ion in the solution separately okay so not like in whole what is the concentration however you have to find it the value x y z three values so there is a problem you cannot do um, and you are only using one reason that is CAD, uh, edta okay so you cannot just do edta titration with the indicator and find those that will give you the total concentration now first what we need to do is we have to max them so how do you mark say them so you have to max two out of these three ions with max king agent and do edta titration okay then you can find the concentration of that ion then afterward was afterward afterward you demax one of the agent one of the ion and once you demax it it is free then again you do the titration and determine the concentration of that ion and then finally, what you can do is you can determine the concentration of all three ions to begin with, like all three ions together with EDTA. You separately find the concentration of two ions, then you can also get the concentration of third ion. So be, uh, between calcium, cadmium, and copper. Let's go back to this slide. Calcium, cadmium, and copper okay so looks like you can use kcn to mask copper and cadmium okay so once you mask with copper and cadmium what remains is calcium and you can determine the concentration of calcium using uh, edta <clears throat> now you found the concentration of calcium you can use this reaction again to demax the cadmium once you demax the cadmium cadmium is free you can again do the titration with edta okay once you do the titration with edta you found the concentration of cadmium as well since you found the calcium of uh, concentration of calcium and cadmium now again you take the original solution and determine the concentration of all together and subtract the value of calcium and cadmium you will get for copper okay you have to do it step wise okay hope you can do that so types of complex symmetric titration so what are some of the types of complex symmetric titration these are it direct titration so direct titration is uh, you have sample and uh, this example is for edta because we are more focused on edta as a complexing isn't uh, so what we have is we have a sample in conical flats with an indicator in it and we uh, drip 
uh, EGTA from conical uh, from burette and we determine the color change of the indicator. We stop it there, which is the end point, and do the calculation to determine the concentration of metal ion. So basically the concentration of EDA is also known ahead. So EDTA is a standard solution as well, okay? Back titration. So in back titration, what you do is, you add excess amount of EDTA, known but excess, okay? So let's say you require only uh, maybe five to seven, you add 10 ml. You mix with the sample and then back titrate with known concentration of ED, uh, zinc. So what you do is you add excess EDTA, then there is some EDTA left over to find out what, what concentration of EDTA is left over, you titrate that leftover with known concentration of zinc. That will help you to determine the concentration of EDTA leftover. And you know what concentration or what amount of EDTA you use to start with, that will give you. So you subtract the leftover, that will give you the used, used up EDTA. Now, once you know the used up EDTA, its concentration and its volume, you can determine the concentration of unknown solution or the concentration of analyte, okay? So this is direct titration. The second one is back titration. You first do excess and then do back titration. Replacement titration. So this replacement titration is excess complex, complex is taken and treated with sample. So you have a uh, XX complex, you already formed the complex and you treat with the sample. And the replaced metal is again titrated with EDTA. So what happens is the sample, it has metal ions, that metal will replace the, uh, the metal in the complex we took in first hand, okay? And whatever that metal is replaced, we, we react it with EDTA to find the concentration of the replaced. So if we find the complex, uh, the concentration of the replaced ions, that is the same concentration in the sample as well. Here it says that manganese will quantitatively replace magnesium from the complex. So how can you utilize this? So first you form magnesium EDTA complex, that known concentration of magnesium EDTA complex. Then you add it in the sample where you want to analyze the concentration of manganese. Then the manganese will quantitatively replace magnesium. So there are free magnesium in this sample now. So that free magnesium you will determine by reacting with by titrating with EDTA from the burette. That is replacement titration. And indirect titration is used for anions like barburate mercury. Then if titrated with EDTA from mercury, EGTA, that is indirect uh, titration, okay? So one of them is direct, where you use directly used EGTA. The other one is back titration, where you use excess EGTA sample and then titrate the, on, uh, the leftover. The other one is the replacement where one, the ion to be analyzed or the analyte will replace the, the metal from metal complex and then it's, the titration is done. And the other one is indirect where you use, uh, you don't use the pure metal, however you have barburate mercury in this case, to titrate with EGTA to form mercury EGTA, okay? So these are the four types of uh, titration, uh, the complex symmetric titration that can be used utilizing EDTA as well. Okay, so in exam, if it is asked what are the different, how can you, what are the application of EDTA in complex symmetric titration, you can say these, these, we can use it this way. Okay, so what is the mechanism of complex symmetric titration? Uh, this is mostly theory and it is very simple as well. 
So the mechanism is the indicator forms a color complex with a metal ion to be titrated, like I said earlier. The uncomplex indicator may be colorless or it could be colored, okay. Uh, such indicators are sometimes called metal, metallochromic indicators. So since they are forming uh, com complex with metal, they are called metal and chromic means color, okay. Metallochromic means formed colored when complex with metal. So what this first point is saying is they have one color with metal when they form complex with metal ion and they may might be colorless or have different color when they form complex with the when they are free the indicator okay and then when the complex complexation reaction of the interest proceed in another liquid phase usually organic solvent in equilibrium with the solution being titrated the indicator are described as extraction indicator so if you use different uh, solvent then the solution then the solvent that is in the original solution then it is called extraction indicator okay our more focus is on metal chromic indicator so when the indicator is influenced by a redox system whose equilibrium is controlled by removal of the metal ion being titrated the indicators are called redox indicator and we are already familiar with the redox indicator they are usually one colored indicator so the most typical complex metal indicator are metallochromic indicator so here we have shown three different mechanism how the complexometric indicator would work and the most common one is metallochromic which is it forms complex with metal so the indicator forms complex with the metal to give color <coughs> the metallochromic indicator is also called metal ion indicator why metal ion indicator because it is, can be used to concentrate to determine the concentration of metal ion okay so metal ion indicator are colored organic compound which themselves form silate with metal ion metal ions so they form silate with metal ions the silate must have a different color from the free indicator like i showed in the previous slides also so the metal ion indicator it can be free or it can form a complex with uh, metal so it has different color when it is free when compared to the color in when it form complex with the metal in this that's how the indicator works right they are chelating as in progressing several ligand atom on suitably deposited for coordination with the metal ions so like uh, discussed earlier they they can form they can form different they can form ligand they can form complex with different several ligand atoms okay they are sensitive to both metal ion concentration so which is pm and hydrogen ion concentration so basically the metal indicator ion indicator are sensitive to ph as well so we have to work in certain ph okay they are mostly used in complexometric titration so they, these metal ion indicators they are mostly used in complexometric titration when EDTA is used as the chelating agent. So these are some of the requisites of metal ion indicator. Uh, you can go through them. Uh, these are basically the revision. However, I just put it so that uh, you know the points. Um, we have already talked about all these points in previous slide. So you can go through them uh, when you have time, okay? So these are three examples of metal ion indicators and we have more examples on following slides. So first example is ereochrome black T, which we call EBT. And the first structure in here is the EBT. The second indicator is Calmagite. The second structure is calmagite in here, okay? And meroxide is the third indicator. The structure of the meroxide is given in here, the third structure. So these indicators, they can have different form. One is acidic form, neutral form, and basic form. So again, acidic, neutral, and basic okay now let's understand this acidic neutral and basic 
and in the bracket there are given colors what is the color in the acidic form what is the color in the neutral form and what is the color in basic form now first look into this ebt so this ebt is represented by h2 in so this in means indicator okay in is indicator everywhere you see this in that means indicator so it has indicator with negative charge that negative charge is from this sulfonated group over here so this is sodium salt that negative charge is here okay and it has two hydrogen h2 you can see there are several hydrogen but however these hydrogens are this oh group hydrogen so there are two oh groups so that means there are two hydrogen so in acidic form there are two H, uh, two hydrogen attached <coughs> the charge on the indicator is negative charge and it is represented by i n okay and the color of that EVT in acidic form is wine red. So in neutral form, instead of that two hydrogen, there is only one hydrogen now. Instead of single charge, there is two negative charge. That means one of these hydrogen is removed and there is negative charge in it. And that is the neutral form and the color of the neutral form is blue. And if another hydrogen is also removed, then it will have now three minus. Okay, there is no hydrogen. That means the other hydrogen is also removed. Three minus because one minus will be in this O minus, the other in this O minus, and the other in the O minus. However, there will be a resonance form also. Okay, <clears throat> and this EBT can be used to determine the concentration of metal ions calcium magnesium barium zinc cadmium and lead okay again they have different color at different ph this is also trying to say there are different ph okay and this this is how the structure is represented in the short form the charge the number of oh group and the indicator okay so Kalmagite, it says that it has one negative charge indicator and two OH group. So two OH group are, one OH group is here, the another OH group is here, and the negative charge will come from when this is the salt form, okay? When this is sulfonated form, the negative charge, one of the negative charge is here, and the adds to IN minus. That is red color, H IN2 minus is blue color when one of these hydrogen is removed. And IN3 minus when all of these hydrogens are removed, you have orange color. And this indicator can be used to determine the concentration of, in during the titration of calcium, magnesium, and cadmium. Okay. Meroxide, it says there are four hydrogens, one negative charge, and indicator. So where are those four hydrogens? Uh, now we, we need to be more uh, clear on the, the number of hydrogen. It is not the hydrogen only on the oxygen or only attached to oxygen. They are also the hydrogen attached to nitrogen, okay? So those hydrogens are, one of these hydrogen is here, they're here, he, uh, two, three, four. Okay, these are the four hydrogens. Four hydrogen attached to nitrogen of this compound and the one of the negative charges here minus okay you can ignore what is the positive charge because you might also consider that this there are four hydrogen here however you have to ignore that because that is just the counter ion the main compound is the larger one okay so this is four hydrogen indicator minus, you remove one of them, then it will be a neutral form, two minus, then you remove the other one, then it will be, there will be two hydrogen remaining, three minus, okay? The color is red, violet, violet, blue, and this indicator can be used to determine during the titration of calcium, 
copper or cobalt. Okay, so remember these indicators are also uh, chelating agent. They form complex with this metal. For example, the meroxide can form complex with calcium. Okay, however, this complex is weak. And when we titrate with EDTA, first EDTA will form complex with free calcium. And once all of the free calcium are used up, there are still some calcium uh, complexing with these uh, indicators. So these indicators are replaced by EDTA to form free indicator. And this free indicator will have different color than the uh, combined indicator. That's how we determine the end point. Okay, and the the color and charge given here, it, it is for the acidic, neutral, and basic form. So these are, this is the table, okay. Uh, some of the other indicators are in combined, the same indicator from the previous slides also, but with some extra indicator. <coughs> The pH range where they work, this is the pH range. So whenever you are using the Cal Magite, you should have basic pH, okay, 9 to 11. And these are the ions you can, when you are titrate, doing the titration for these ions, you can use this indicator, okay? Now we go into precipitation titration. Uh, and the, we'll directly go into precipitation indicator. So there are three types of precipitation indicator, Moore method, Volward method, and Kazan's method. Okay, that's how this, you can use this indicator. So in Moore's method, the formation of color PPT at the end point, so you form PPT, which is colored, okay? Volhard method, formation of soluble color complex. So in here you are forming the soluble color complex. And Fazan's method, this is the adsorption of the color indicator on the PPT at the end point. So this is more important one. Okay. So you are forming the you are forming you are forming the adsorption of the color indicator. So adsorption means on the surface, okay? On the surface, you are forming the colored compound. So here is an example of dichlorofluorescein, okay? In the, this dichlorofluorescein will attach to the surface of the PPT, and once it is attached, the color changes. Okay, so what is the difference? The difference is the first one is you form the colored compound, colored PPT. The second one is you form the colored complex, which is also soluble. The solution is sol uh, colored. Okay, in first one, the PPT is colored. The whole PPT is colored. In second one, the solution is colored. And the last one, the indicator is attached to the surface of the PPT. And when it is attached, that is colored, okay? Not whole PPT is colored, just the surface is colored. So adsorption indicator. So adsorption is a indicator is a types of precipitation indicator, which attached to, which is adsorbed on the surface of the precipitate, causing a color change in the indicator. So for example, here is the AgNO3 and you have AgCl, uh, NaCl. When you do the reaction, you form AgCl. When the AgCl PPT is formed, okay, this fluorescein will attach to the surface of AgCl to form the color change, okay? So this was first introduced by Fazan. That's why it is called Fazan indicator. So action of this indicator is due to the fact that at the equivalent point, the indicator is adsorbed by the precipitate and during the process of adsorption, a change occurs in the indicator which leads to the 
to a substance of different color and they have been if therefore Tom's has an adjacent indicator. <clears throat> so again, you are doing the titration. Say you have chloride minus in the solution and you are doing the titration with AgNO3. And once you keep adding the AgNO3, uh, whenever you, you keep forming the PPT, keep forming the PPT, and when you add the last drop of AgNO3, which will equilibrate with Cl minus, there is no more Cl minus, then this fluorescein will come into play to form the colored compound. Okay, the substances employed are either acid dyes, such as those of fluorescins series, and these are some of the example of fluorescein, fluorescein, eosin, which are utilized as sodium, and uh, rhodamine, okay, the silver, halogen, salt. Adsorption indicator. So this is the mechanism, the, the, the theory of the indicator, okay? So let's understand the theory and uh, there is the picture on the next slide, which will help you to understand even more. Okay, so when a chloride solution is titrated with the solution of silver nitrate, so here you have the chloride. So here you are trying to uh, determine the concentration of chloride ion in your sample and for that you are using silver nitrate standard okay the precipitate AgCl is formed so you have chloride ion in your conical flask and you are adding uh, AgNO3 from the burette and during that process you are forming AgCl right so you keep adding silver nitrate you keep forming AgCl until Cl minus exists okay so a precipitate has a tendency to adsorb it on ions. So in this time, as long as you can have uh, chloride ion, it will form AgCl, 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 okay? Because that will form precipitate. This may be termed as a primary adsorption layer. So in that PPT, you have several layer. The first layer, the inner layer is called primary adsorption layer. And the primary adsorption layer is the the PPT of primary ions. What are those two primary ions? Silver and chloride. Okay. So by a process known as secondary adsorption, oppositely charged ions present in the solution are held around it. Uh, so for example, uh, in your conical flask, you have now you form AgCl precipitate, that is your primary layer, and you still have chloride ions, right? So you still have excess chloride ion that will exist outside this AgCl as a different layer. And that layer is called um, secondary layer, okay? So as soon as the stoichiometric point is reached, that means as soon as the all of them are reacted. Silver ions are present in excess and then these now become primary, become primarily adsorbed. Nitrate ion will help secondary adsorption. So what happens is once all of the chloride ions is used up, now AgCl will be the, the PPT and on the outer surface, first layer, after that AgCl will be Ag plus. Why Ag plus? Because now all the chloride ion is used up and you added excess silver from burette, that will be your next layer, okay? That will be your silver ion will be your next layer. Then outside the silver ion you will have, silver ion is the positive ion, you will have negative ion outside the silver ion which is nitrate ion as a secondary adsorption, okay? So again, the PPT is the main one, that is the core, AgCl is the core. If chloride is excess, then chloride will be the primary layer, that is negative ion, and the, the next ion, positive ion, will be the outer layer, okay? The fluorescein is also present, here the fluorescein is the indicator, is also present. In the solution, the negative fluorescein ion 
So the fluorescent ion is negative ion, okay, it is anion, which much more stronger absorbed than in the nitrate ion is immediately absorbed and will reveal its presence on the PPT, not by its own color, which is that of the solution, but by formixing the modified fluorescent ion on the surface ion, which occurs with the formation of a colored substance. So we'll look into this on the next slides, but it might be a little bit easier. <clears throat> so here, here you can see it, okay. So uh, let's focus on A first, the diagram A. So in A, you have AgCl precipitate. And AgCl is the precipitate in all these cases, okay? All of them. Now focus on A. So AgCl is the main core of the PPT. If on the conical flask, you have more of the chloride ion, then chloride will form the primary layer. So this chloride is forming the primary layer. Okay? So AgCl precipitate in excess of Cl minus. So why chloride is forming the primary layer? Because the PPT is of Ag and Cl, and Cl is also one of the ion of the PPT. Since chloride is also one of the ion of the PPT, it will form the primary layer. And does this, uh, in this particular class, is there any silver? No, there is no any silver because if there was any silver ion, then it could have reacted with chloride ion to form AgCl. Now, this is the primary layer, which is negative ion at the moment. Now, in the same conical flask, you also have positive ion, which is sodium ion, okay? That will be your secondary layer. Again, core is AgCl, always. One of the ion, if it is accessed, then that will be your primary layer. And the counter ion, which is primary layer, is the negative ion, then the secondary layer will be positive ion, okay? Now, in B. So, B is, the core is also silver chloride, that is the PPT. Now, instead of chloride ion, now you have silver ion that is in excess, okay? You don't have chloride ion at all. All of them are used up. Now, the silver ion, it is excess, and also silver is one of the ion, right? One of the ion of silver chloride, it will form the primary layer. And since the silver is positive ion, the secondary layer will be of negative ion. So, one more time. In A, the primary layer is the negative ion, so the secondary layer will be the positive ion. And it is negative ion is the primary layer because chloride is also one of the ion of the PPT. In B, positive ion is the primary layer because silver is also one of the ion of PPT. In A, chloride is excess. In B, silver is excess. In A, all the silver ion is used up. In B, all the chloride ion is used up. Okay. Now, this, these are before the colored complex is formed. Okay. Now here is the C at the equivalent point. So what happens at the equivalent point? That means A, it is like A, okay? A goes to C, B goes to D. So what happens in A? You have chloride ion in the chlorinical flask. You keep adding silver nitrate from burette. As you keep adding, the silver that comes from burette will react with silver, uh, the chloride to form silver chloride PPT. So it keeps forming the silver chloride forming PPT, silver chloride PPT. Uh, the last drop that you add the silver nitrate there is no silver or no chloride excess, okay? None of them is excess. Since none of them is excess, you will have the indicator that you already added in the conical flask. The indicator will now form the primary layer. So the indicator will form the primary layer. Earlier, the indicator was free, so it has different color. Now it forms the primary layer. It will have different color. And that is how you determine the equivalent point. Okay. So look into the figure. At the end, or the, at the equivalent point, the fluorescein in here. Earlier it was free, so it had different color. Now it is adsorbed on the surface of AgCl. Why? Because there is no excess chloride or no excess silver. If there was excess chloride or excess silver, then one of these would have occurred, either A or B would have occurred. However, none of them is excess. They are used completely. The indicator will form the primary layer, and that is how the color is observed. Okay? So the fluorescein is negative ion. So in previous slide, it showed that um, the, the last point was the negative ion fluorine fluorescein will form the primary layer 
and we have the color complex. Similarly, in the D, okay, positive ion indicator is forming the primary clear, okay, and it will have different color. Since the positive ion is the primary layer, negative ion is the secondary layer. Okay, I hope it is clear. So A and B is when one of these own ion is in excess, either silver is in excess or chloride is in excess, then it is A or B. If at the equivalent point, the indicator will come into the primary layer and give the color changes, okay? So this is the condition on how to choose the suitable adsorption indicator. <clears throat> so the precipitate should separate as far as possible in the colloidal condition. So it should be the colloidal form, like homogeneous non-crystallous form. Large quantity of neutral salt participate, particularly of multiple charged ions should be avoided owing to their conjugating, con, congelating effect. The solution should not be too dilute as the amount of precipitate formed will be small and the uh, color change far from sharp with certain indicator. So it, there's, it should not be very dilute, okay? It will be very difficult to indicate the end point. The indicator ion must be of opposite charge of to the ion of the precipitating agent. So indicator, like I said earlier, it can have positive charge or negative charge. It should be negative, it should be opposite to the ion of precipitating agent, okay? The indicator ions should not be adsorbed before the particular compound. So like earlier, the primary layer should be formed by the own ion, okay? And as soon as the own ion is used up, then only the indicator will form the uh, primary layer and it should not form particular compound so it should not form pp it should not form ppt with any of the ions so these are some of the indicator of adsorption indicator and what they can be used for so fluorescein for example can be used to uh, to in, during the titration of titration to determine the concentration of chloride, bromide, iodide with silver. And these are all other rhodamine G, uh, 6G can be used for the, to determine the concentration of chloride, bromide with silver. And phenosephrine can be used to determine the concentration of silver with bromide ion. Okay. So today we discussed about uh, complexometric titration, <clears throat> different complexing agent, a metal ion indicator, and uh, some examples of their color change. Then we went into the uh, precipitation titration. In pre precipitation titration, we directly went into adsorption indicator we discussed the uh, main precipitate, the primary layer and the secondary layer that is formed in during uh, precipitation titration. Uh, we understood the mechanism of adsorption indicator, how the color change occurs, and we understood how to draw that figure of uh, AGCL in, in the middle, then chloride ion is the primary layer and since chloride is the negative ion, we should have positive ion as the secondary layer. And once all the chloride is used up, you can have fluorescein, which is F, which we indicated as my negative sign and that will have different color. Okay, uh, with this, uh, I would like to close this lecture here. See you in lecture four next time.